finding. No, thank you for reminding me that. <laughs> yeah, this is always recorded. Yeah, go ahead, Ashwin. All right, yeah, thanks, Kamlesh, and uh, thanks everyone for uh, joining this session. Um, so I'm Ashwat Govindan, as uh, Kamlesh already introduced. Um, I'm the co-founder of uh, Spydra. And uh, before Spydra, a quick introduction about myself, right? So before Spydra, I used to work for almost 16 years with Microsoft, mostly uh, focused on the cloud technologies and uh, uh, security identity and eventually blockchain. Uh, and I, I helped a lot of customers around the globe adopt various cloud scale technologies and uh, build solutions on top of it uh, for a long time. So uh, as we all know, right, um, there is a lot of uh, use cases um, in, in any business or traditional enterprise space where blockchain can help, right, where there are multiple parties, parties or organizations in this, in this context that are involved in a business process. And blockchain is one of the way where, uh, you know, the, some of those business processes can be streamlined and uh, data can be shared transparently uh, with all the goodness of blockchain, right, that we all understand. But in today's world, right, it's a bit, if you look at uh, any organization that wants to adopt blockchain and do something with it, there's a lot of friction as such, right? And uh, uh, organizations find it difficult to move from traditional uh, web two technologies that they understand very well to uh, something like blockchain, right? And that's where most of, uh, uh, that's where we are focused on as a company. So our mission fundamentally is to make the adoption of blockchain uh, technologies very easy for enterprise and you know, uh, customers with uh, organizations so that uh, they can basically uh, use and integrate with blockchain, just like you would do with a reg regular database, for example, right? And not worry too much about how the technology works. Don't have to, you know, fully uh, understand the internals of how blockchain works and what it does and, you know, things like order or peer in a hyperledger fa uh, fabric environment, for example, right? So that's why where uh, we have been working with a lot of customers to implement a lot of the blockchain use cases uh, for various industries, right? And then what we found was that we were doing a lot of repetitive work, right? Um, right from deploying infrastructure. So because we are talking about the private or enterprise blockchain space, so there's always some infrastructure that you have to deploy that to at scale, right? And when multiple organizations are in involved and when you have to actually scale your use case and onboard multiple participants, there's a lot of infrastructure definitely involved. So right from that to actually developing the solution on blockchain to integrating it with existing applications, there's a lot of things which, which are not available out of the box, but at the same time, you know, those are repetitive kind of tasks that you have to do for every customer. So that's where, you know, based on our learnings, we came up with the asset tokenization platform, uh, which is basically a platform that we provide to easily tokenize any uh, online or off, offline physical assets on a blockchain and uh, make, make it very easy for customers to do so. So our platform is currently fully built on Hyperledger Fabric um, and basically covers, you know, uh, different use cases across different industries, but more focused on the enterprise use cases or the enterprise uh, side of blockchain at this point of time. Yeah. So uh, in today's session, right, what I I want to do is to basically share some of those learnings, right, from uh, from working with multiple customers and uh, basically talk about what are some of the uh, the things that repetitive things that we have tried to optimize or you know basically come up with a solution around it a reusable kind of a framework and a platform around it which makes that adoption easier right so uh, what is asset tokenization uh, first of all right uh, i'm sure you all know about it but you know just to uh, just to level set um, everyone right um, so asset tokenization is basically uh, all about turning any asset which is of value. Uh, value could be actually actual value or it could be intangible also, right? Uh, but turning that into a digital representation so that then you can do a lot of things around it, right? You can start uh, tracking things. So, you know, a lot of the uh, 
in, in the supply chain use cases, you can start tracking things or you can start trading things after that, after doing that. Uh, so it could be physical objects, uh, it could be, you know, intangible objects like, uh, you know, uh, uh, intellectual property, it could be things like, you know, even invoices and uh, things in the uh, supply chain industry or financial uh, industry, it could actually be real money also, right? Uh, fiat currency or, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies, uh, CBDC, uh, loyalty points, things like that, right? So anything which which you want to uh, have a digital representation and easily basically uh, track or trade between multiple entities that are involved in a trustless manner, right? So that is what asset tokenization is all about. Um, I would also like to delve a little bit on the, you know, when we talk about asset tokenization, typically what most of the conversation involves around is, you know, around NFTs and cryptocurrencies. Although that is where a lot of the asset tokenization use cases are today, where, you know, you tokenize something and then basically start trading it, right? Like, for example, even if it's a real estate uh, asset that we are talking about. Once you tokenize it, then you will basically say, okay, I want to create some tokens out of it. Um, and then, you know, users or uh, pe uh, people can basically then uh, buy those tokens and es essentially by way of doing that, own the real estate uh, or, you know, fraction of it, depending upon whether you fractionalize it or sell it as a whole and things like that, right? So most of the asset tokenization use cases today, one way or the other deals with you know, either creating an NFT, a non-fungible token, or a fungible token, and then, you know, you start trading things, right? You start uh, changing ownership, you start uh, basically, uh, basically start, uh, uh, start owning it and trading things, right? So uh, that's where most of the things happen. But not everything is about trading, right? When we talk about asset tokenization, like in a, if I, if you look at the supply chain industry, I might want to tokenize an asset, like let's say a shipment, right? Which contains certain goods or products. And then that shipment moves between multiple uh, organizations. There's a manufacturer who actually creates the product. Then it gets shipped to via a logistics provider uh, to a distributor who eventually then sells it to a retailer and then to the final customer. So here it's not really, you know, you, you tokenize that particular shipment and the product not to really trade it, right? But basically to start tracking it as such, right? So, so uh, although NFTs and cryptos are one of the uh, big use cases uh, when it comes to uh, or you know, things that people normally do, um, asset tokenization is not just about that as such, right? And of course, there are, there are a lot of standards which uh, even Kamlesh was mentioning, right? There's ERC-20 for fungible tokens, 721 for non-fungible, 1155 for uh, a standard which deals with both fungible and non-fungible tokens. Mostly these come from the e Ethereum uh, side of things, but you know they are still standards, right? So you can actually implement them in any, any uh, blockchain as such. Uh, but when it comes to, you know, really uh, scaling asset tokenization, scaling means I'm not really talking about performance at this point of time, but basically using the concept of asset tokenization across industries for different kinds of needs, right? And basically really utilizing blockchain uh, across industries, right? Uh, it's not even just about the standards, right? Because a lot of the use cases would require you to do things beyond the standards as well. Like for example, right? Um, if you are, uh, if I take the same, you know, example of a, a shipment that you tokenize in a in a blockchain. Let's say you create an NFT, right, which represents the uh, the actual uh, shipment. Now, as part of the ERC seven twenty one or one one five five standards, there will be a certain set of methods that will be that you'll have to implement like for example you'll have to say okay uh, you know how a single transfer or uh, safe transfer from uh, what is a balance so there are, there are methods for that right but then you know just by implementing those methods maybe you won't be able to do everything for example right uh, what if i need to find out all the shipments that have been delayed right there is no uh, there is no out of the box or you know there is no method defined in any standard which will uh, which will let you 
query something like that right uh, which is a very uh, very generic query if i may call it that way right so think about it uh, like this right um, block one, blockchain is sort of like a decentralized database in a way right an immutable decentralized database in a typical database system once you add a record into the system then you can start querying and do a lot of things with that with a lot of flexibility unfortunately when we talk about blockchain that's not it's it's not you know as flexible as a traditional database right so once you start creating assets in the blockchain there are limited things that you can do with it right you can execute certain functions if you want to go beyond that then you'll have to start rolling your own things right you have to start looking at going above and beyond beyond these standards and then uh, start doing things your own way so there's a good uh, related presentation also on this which just happened a couple of weeks ago which in a similar you know hyperledger meetup i believe in uh, in us uh, where daniel barbosa was talking about you know asset tokenization it, it's it's really far more than nfts and crypto right so today what i'll talk i'll talk about is you know not the typical nft and crypto use cases which i believe has been talked about a lot right but what if you want to do asset tokenization and use as a to asset tokenization and maybe you know solve other other use cases like track and trace in a uh, su uh, supply chain or maybe something in the fintech space or insurance space where you have to uh, participate collaborate with multiple participants and uh, uh do things like supply chain financing or in invoice discounting so these kind of things right so um so i, I was talking about what asset tokenization is fundamentally right but what is this what can you actually do with it right uh, there are a lot of things that you can do with it or a lot of things that it does really um you can be it brings in transparency which uh, obviously we all know uh, is what blockchain really stands for so it makes the same set of data available to different participants and that itself um, basically uh, unlocks a lot of use cases right uh, it can bring in efficiency across uh, systems that are owned by multiple participants so the moment you enable this information flow uh and a single source of truth where uh you know instead of having different disparate uh information systems and data that is stored in different systems uh once you have a single source of truth that information can be accessed by multiple participants and systems that are owned by multiple participants and that can actually bring in uh, operational efficiencies and even eventually cost savings because of that um and uh, you know we can do things like we do a lot of automation in the blockchain itself via smart contracts which can basically use that data and then execute some business processes automatically uh, rather than you know uh, a lot of the manual business process that happen today uh, and then of course there's the uh, you know trading and fraction fractionalization part of it where you can convert uh, real world assets into tokens and then you can you know start trading them you can start uh, changing the ownership of them or assigning the ownership of them and things like that which makes that which makes illiquid assets more uh, liquid and accessible to to uh, folks at large so at a high level right what goes into a successful asset tokenization solution um i would say there are three important things right one is um and specifically as we are talking about you know the private or the enterprise blockchain side of things right um the first step is obviously having an infrastructure built up among all the participants in the in the network right um which is definitely one of the things that you have to do and it's not just about setting up the infrastructure but also managing it over a period of time right and then once you have the infrastructure you need to start uh, basically uh, developing smart contracts which is basically literally code right which runs in the blockchain and then once you have the infrastructure and the smart contracts uh, built uh, of course blockchain cannot really exist by itself right um, the real value comes when blockchain uh, when other other applications applications that are there in a customers or organizations ecosystem uh, already 
they can be integrated with blockchain and blockchain can be truly integrated into existing business processes right that's when the true value of it comes so that's the that's the last thing which is integrating applications into existing ecosystem right uh, so so let's let's start talking about um, all, all of these one by one right so when we are talking about managing infrastructure right there's the automation uh, part of it right and we believe truly that you know infrastructure can be managed at scale and uh, in a long run only through automation uh, a lot of organizations and teams start with you know deploying for example hyperledger fabric uh, manually right and then the problems start emerging initially you know just to get a very small network up and running is probably very easy you can also also use a test network and you know it'll it'll be done in five minutes right or a couple of minutes uh, but then the real challenges start coming when you have to onboard multiple organizations those organizations can really be you know distributed across uh, different geographies everybody has their own could be have their own cloud could have their own on-premises where they want their nodes to be hosted so on and so forth right and then of course there could be and specifically now I'm coming to Hyperledger Fabric um, and, you know, most of the rest of the talk, I'll be focused more on how to do all of this in Hyperledger Fabric, right? So I'll be using some of the specific Hyperledger Fabric terminologies. So when it comes to Hyperledger Fabric, right, you can create multiple channels. Uh, you can have different organizations participating in those channels. There could be multiple nodes. You can have chain codes, uh, different versions of chain codes. You can upgrade a chain code, a lot of those things, right? So uh, all of this, you know, eventually uh, requires some sort of automation, right? So I think, you know, when, whenever we are talking about doing something in asset tokenization at scale, having that a solution, which basically automates a lot of the infrastructure, infrastructure side of things in terms of deploying and managing is very important. And also, you know, there's a lot of... Um, uh, keying material that is used, right? So there are keys, there are certificates, even the nodes in a Hyperledger Fabric uh, infrastructure requires uh, certificates or user certificates, right? And then in the long run, uh, even if you provision certificates in the first place, they will expire after some time, right? So you'll have to start renewing them. So there's a lot of automation that goes into it. You need to figure out where to store those certificates securely. Uh, what we are seeing is that a lot of customers who uh, deploy Hyperledger Fabric follow the test network and then the certificates are stored in a file, file system somewhere, which is not the right way to do that, right? Certificates are sensitive. Who get, whoever gets access to the certificates can really compromise the entire system, right? So probably you would rather store it in a secure key store like a vault, right? A HashiCorp vault or uh, Azure key vault or any equivalent uh, kind of technologies right out there. Um, and then of course, you know, um, as I said, the customer's environment can span across and uh, uh, the, uh, and everybody needs control of their nodes while still being part of the same uh, same blockchain network. So that's where, you know, what we have done is basically uh, we have uh, automated a lot of this in our, you know, uh, so we, we did, we started with automating this for our customers that we have been working with. And then eventually, you know, brought it into a platform that now customers can use directly. So I'll, I'll, I'll show you that. But before that, you know, I'll talk about how, how we have gone about Yeah, did we lost the Ashwat or yeah, Ashwat? Yeah, we can't hear anything. Yeah, Ashwat, we lost you. Maybe some network issue. You can wait for some time. Yeah, I think it, it dropped out. Yeah. Just let me check. Yeah. 
here on this back. Maybe they lost network. Just wait. Uh, check if I should. Yeah, he just joining back. He just joined. Hello, everyone. Sorry about that uh, network issue, and you know it always happens when you are <laughs> presenting or doing a demo, so it always goes wrong. So <laughs> no, okay, no, sorry no. about that. So let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Yeah, yeah, oh, we can see. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so uh, so basically, I was talking about the automation, right? Automation of the infrastructure. So the way that we had done the automation is made primarily by using Hyperledger Bevel, right? Where uh, um, we basically have a, a central control plane, kind of, where you know users can come in and then i'll show you that but then once you perform network operations uh, on the console uh, we basically use jenkins to schedule the automation and then which internally uses hyperledger bevel uh, and eventually you know the the network is managed through that uh, so we although we have used hyperledger bevel as such we had to do some modifications to it because bevel is more general purpose right uh, which deals with different blockchain networks, but we specifically deal with Hyperledger Fabric and then uh, specific in a, in a specific way, right, where we want to provision multiple organizations, for example, together or multiple nodes and so on and so forth. So, so we had to do some optimizations in terms of performance and, uh, you know, the time taken uh, to do all of that. So we had done some parallelization rather than sequen sequentially operating things and things like that. And eventually, you know, uh, basically, uh, using that, we we basically manage the network. So I'll quickly show you uh, how how we do that in our platform. So let me switch to the uh, the platform. So you can actually you can also go to spider.app and then you can sign up to our platform. And once you sign up, you know you get a certain set of free credits. So you get almost four hundred credits that you can used to uh, use to try out the platform as such so once you sign up right this is the kind of a view that you will get um, and on the platform as you can see right uh, you can create organizations networks and applications uh, so network is basically the blockchain network but as we all know uh, before uh, for a blockchain network you need to the multiple participants in a enterprise or a private blockchain network are, are organizations so you create organizations first so creating organization is nothing, you know, it's pretty simple. You provide the name and a few other details, which I'll not go into. What I'll focus more is in the network part, right? 
So we have tried to make it a little bit more simpler, as you can see, as you probably know, right, in Hyperledger Fabric, uh, there are a lot of things like uh, order peers, and then there are a lot of options that you can configure, right? But, um, but basically, um, as a customer, right, you may not need to configure all of those options upfront. So we have pick the most important things which are meaningful for any organization and any use case and basically expose those as, op those as options to start with. Of course, you can customize things as you go along and change things, right? So for example, when you create a network, uh, basically you uh, select an organization as the, the organization that is sort of creating the network and then you can invite other organization also, organizations also to be part of the network. I'll just give a name so this is pretty simple, but then most of the uh, options um, uh, or, or the interesting happen things happen in the configuration screen, right? Uh, we provide an option of uh, creating a network in a shared environment or a dedicated. The fundamental difference is, you know, in a dedicated environment, there's a lot more isolation uh, completely at the uh, at the infrastructure level, like where the servers are, the servers that host the nodes or the Kubernetes clusters that host the nodes. Um, and uh, the, even the network through which you know everything flows, right? So dedicated virtual private networks and things like that. Um, we, as a customer, uh, you can select a cloud provider. So we support AWS currently, and we also uh, will be supporting Azure very soon. We support multiple cloud regions. So this is our test environment. So you only see a couple, but uh, we support uh, multiple regions across across AWS. Um, and then, you know, uh, there are built-in configurations that you can directly deploy. Like I, I can say that, you know, if I want to support like around 20 requests per second uh, for a proof of concept, then I will create a small network and there are some pre-configured pre um, settings which apply, right? So this is where I was saying, instead of going and individually saying, okay, I want to have this many uh, nodes, this many size, these are the settings, these are the endorsement policies, these are so on and so forth, right? Um, you can basically select a pre-configured configuration and then deploy it um, as such. There is an advanced mode also where we can, we can basically uh, tweak a lot of those settings as well. Um, so that's pretty much it, right? Uh, as you can see, uh, once you do that, uh, the network gets uh, sort of created or start, oops. Did I do something wrong? Okay. I think I have a little bit of problem with my internet. Uh, this connection is not stable. So what I'll do is let me go back and show you an actual network. Okay, so I think it actually got created, but maybe the network uh, is uh, switching on and off. Um, so that's pretty much it, right? Uh, it got created and then, uh, then uh, things start happening behind the scenes where the actual automation starts kicking in. Uh, so if I look at the um, one of the existing network, right, that uh, we have created, um, so you can see that once you create a network, right, uh, there are you can actually uh, add other organizations. So either you can add organizations that you yourself own. So I can create multiple organizations as an administrator, and then you know add them to the blockchain network. That's one way of doing it. Or I can invite uh, someone from a different uh, uh, organization, right? By providing an email address um, and uh, basically inviting them, right? Uh, you can also select the level of, uh, level of uh, permissions or level of access in general that the second organization will get uh, to the same network that you are inviting. So you can say that this other organization is a network admin, which means they get equal rights and exactly the same kind of rights on the network. So here, basically, we are talking about, you know, the kind of endorsement policies that that are applied and uh, whether they, the if, if the other organizations are network admin, right, so they can literally administer the network completely. They can also deploy order, order nodes in, into the network. While if you're a network or contributor, right, then you cannot, for example, uh, deploy order nodes and be part of the ordering process. And, uh, Similarly, if you're a network contributor, you cannot invite other organizations. So basically, you not, uh, uh, cannot decide who else, who else to, uh, who else gets to be part of the network, and so on and so forth. Right. So basically, this is sort of uh, mirroring the 
hyperledger uh, fabrics acl itself and how things work within acl right but instead of exposing the raw acls and endorsement policies we have bundled them into roles which uh, which basically um, provide certain pre-built settings out of the box uh, and those those settings are applied to the invited organization so basically um, that's how you can be um, and you can form a consortium or a network with multiple participants and uh, do not worry about actual deployment of the uh, infrastructure and uh, the configurations behind the scenes. Um, and then, of course, you know, once you uh, have an infrastructure, you can start uh, doing more uh, granular configurations, like you can create channels, uh, you can basically, uh, you know, add or uh, modify the existing nodes. Uh, you can start adding applications which are nothing but chain code. Uh, so we basically provide a pre-configured application also, which I'll talk come, come to in the next set of slides. But uh, essentially you can also bring your own application as in you know, your own chain code. So we support Node.js and Golang at this time. So you can you know, create the application. And once you create an application, you can add different versions to the application. And then basically you can deploy uh, an application on a particular channel um, and things like that, right? So the typical uh, typical chain code lifecycle operations you can do, uh, and all the other you know um, all the other typical operations that you would do on a fabric network, right? Hyperledger fabric network. Um, so that's that's you know that's the first part, right? Which is more about automating the infrastructure side of things, also, which we believe is you know fundamental to any. To, to running any uh, blockchain network and basically productionizing it, right? And running it at scale. Um, there are, you know, you'll have to monitor the network, you'll have to look at statistics for the network, you know, things like that, right? It's a lot of, and you know, if you, if there's something wrong, you need to get alerted uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of things like that, right? So, so uh, you need a platform which does all of that and uh, the, the intention of, uh, designing our platform also or creating our platform was to do that itself right but then uh, that's not where uh, you know things uh, that's not everything right once you have a infrastructure right the question is then what right the second step is all about developing smart contracts now of course you can um, develop a smart contract uh, you can start writing code in Golang, Node.js, uh, specifically when it comes to Hyperledger Fabric uh, or Java, you know, whatever language you're comfortable with. But then, you know, uh, let's take a step back to asset tokenization again, right? And basically what is an asset? So there's a lot of, you know, different terminology that uh, folks use, right? Um, of course, uh, NFTs and fungible tokens are definitely assets which everyone is familiar, familiar with. But then, you know, NFTs today is mostly used for you know, uh, creating a, so what is an NFT really? It's a, it's really, if you look at it, it's really an object with a unique identifier, right? Where one token is not the same as a separate, uh, as a different token. So there is something unique between these two. So if, uh, if the NFT is that of a painting, for example, painting number one and painting number two has something unique, which, uh, which, uh, which makes them different, right? So think of it like, a, if you think of it at the fundamental level, it's an object with a unique, identifier or a unique property, right? Is what an NFT. Uh, folks talk about dynamic NFT, which is more about saying that, okay, you know, uh, NFT doesn't have to be constrained to only, you know, something with a URL and an image, right? Where uh, the, the properties of an, the, the NFT is hosted or how the image looks like or a video or, or, or you know, actual, um, some object of the actual NFT, right? It can have its own properties, right? So in, in a traditional sense, anything, right? Uh, an, a real estate, uh, which has a particular ID, a name, address, locality, uh, is an NFT because it, it has a unique prop ID and it, it describes something about the, uh, about the, uh, the residential property itself. Or it could be an invoice, right? Which again has an ID, has some properties, right? So folks sometimes refer to this as dynamic NFT, but it's all asset, right? So we, we mostly mostly refer to it as an asset uh, because token, uh, at least to me, sounds like more like something, you know, which is a, 
which is something that you normally use for trading, right? And that's where I want to bring out the distinction that not everything is about trading. Asset tokenization is all about creating a digital representation of that asset, which you can do in any number of ways, right? Now, what are some of the challenges, right? Uh, when we talk about asset tokenization uh, or creating the digital representation. Um, so in any real world use case, right? Uh, there could be multiple types of assets. And um, so let's talk about a use case, right? Let's say, and this is an actual example that we are a real project that we did with, with, uh, with the hospital, big hospital chain and uh, insurance providers. So the, the uh, whole uh, problem that we are trying to solve was around insurance and uh, uh, claim settlement, right, in the insurance, in the, in the healthcare industry. So claim settlement process, typically you probably have experienced it yourself, it takes a long time. There are a lot of things to look at. Uh, there's a lot, lot of back and forth that happens between the customer, the hospital, there's, a, there's an insurance provider and there's normally a uh, third party administrator, right, a TPA. Um, and this is actually very ripe, ripe use case for, uh, for blockchain because there are multiple parties involved and there is some information that is about a particular diagnosis and something that was uh, you know, related to a hospital visit that needs to be shared between all of these parties in a transparent manner uh, based on which certain decisions have to be made and a claim settlement has to be done, right? So uh, in, in, a, in, in, in this kind of a use case, right, there is certain information about the uh, patient, the insurance, the diagnosis that happened uh, on in the and the procedures that happened in the hospital that needs to be shared, right? So if you look at this kind of a uh, use case, right? And uh, if I look at, uh, so there are some standards which uh, which deals with uh, with this kind of patient information as well. So there's something called as FHIR, uh, which is a standard which is used by primarily by the US, but also you know other countries are also getting on board to this. Uh, FHIR standard is all about how do you represent patient related information, patient and healthcare related information in a standard way so that different participants can basically consume the same information uh, easily, right? So as you can see right here, there are almost 150 different types of objects, right? So ranging from, let's say uh, an observation, which is basically a diagnosis that happens. There are uh, documents or diagnostic reports that are created. There is definitely, you know, a uh, patient. Uh, it's kind of difficult to find in this. Yeah, so yeah, there are there's a specific schema for patient, a specific scheme for insurance, for example. Uh, so insurance plan is here. If, when you are doing a claim settlement, uh, how a claim form should look like, how this should look like, investing payments, right? So there's a lot of, lot of uh, schemas which are already defined. And literally, if you are talking about representing all of this uh, in the blockchain. Now, of course, everything need not go into the blockchain, but at least a lot of lot of the information needs to go into the blockchain if we are to really solve the insurance claim settlement use case in the healthcare industry. So this is the kind of assets that we are talking about that will go into the blockchain, right? So now if you are to really, uh, if you are to really, uh, so I'm, I'm getting messages that the, uh, Network connection is unstable. I'm just hoping that you can hear me. Uh, folks, can you hear me properly? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah. So what I was saying was that these are the kind of assets that need to go into the blockchain, right? So that's where you know uh, mostly what. Uh, uh, and mostly then uh, in today's world, right, you, you'll have to start writing code to do all of that, right? Uh, unlike a typical database in Hyper just Fabric, or even in any other blockchain, there is no concept of a table or you know, a collection or whatever you call it. You can't directly define that. But there is no easy way to just carry and create assets out of the box, right? You have to write, start writing code for everything. And then once you start putting all this information in, there's no easy way or flexible way to query things and get out of it, right? And also there's a lot of things that now has to happen. Like for example, patient record can only be created by a hospital, cannot be created by a, a, 
the insurance provider, for example, right? Insurance policy can be created only by the insurance provider, but not by the patient and so on and so forth, or the hospital and so on and so forth, right? So then you have to start defining permissions and all of that, right? Of course, you can write chain code to do all of that, but there's a lot of complexity that comes into it, right? So this is kind of an asset model. I, this is a very simplified asset model uh, uh, we have come up with just for this demo. Let's say there's a patient, right? And patient visits a hospital, uh, there's an insurance uh, plan that the patient has. Uh, they perform, the doctor performs a diagnosis, which is an observation. Some procedures are done, and then a claim is uh, filed, which needs to be settled, right? So if you can see, uh, you, this is an asset model, and there are references that point to each other, right? Like patient has policies, observation is for a patient, which is stored in a subject, an attribute per subject. There's a claim which, uh, which you know, then is created for a patient, for a diagnosis, for a certain set of procedures, and uh, uh, there's an insurance uh, that needs to be used, right, to settle the thing. So now, how do you do all, keep do do all of that, right, in the blockchain? And that's where our second part of the solution comes in, which is all about um, the the, the built-in application that we provide, that is called as uh, asset tokenization. So the the uh, intent of the asset tokenization solution is basically to uh, provide. Uh, so let me go back. Oh, sorry. Sorry, my internet connection is really stuck today. Uh, so let me go to. Yeah. So if I go to deployed applications, right? So. <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, this is the asset tokenization solution that I've already deployed. So if I go to the asset tokenization solution, uh, there are a few settings that I'll, I'll show you, right? Um, so basically, if I go to the settings, right, um, what we have provided is a way to, just like I was saying, right, uh, similar to a, similar to a, um, database right we have provided a way to create asset types think of this like uh, creating tables right um, so you can basically create multiple tables but you don't have to provide a lot of information unlike a table where you have to provide a lot of uh, you know you have different columns right that belong to a state uh, to a table and uh, if i come back related this back to the insurance settlement use case um, the hospital might already be using a uh, a system to manage the patient records and the health information, right? So they have already defined all of that in their existing system. So you don't want them to define all of that again in in the blockchain as such, right? So all that we are saying is that, okay, define a key uh, and tell us the, uh, what is the name of the set, right? And then the second thing that uh, we allow customers to do is to basically define the references. Like for example, if I look at the most complex uh, reference here, uh, it's the claim which has a uh, field called patient that points to a patient, which means this is like foreign key references in our database, right? Where a claim has information of which patient it belongs to uh, and which field it belongs, uh, which uh, diagnosis or observation uh, this claim is being uh, settled against and which procedure and which insurance needs to be used, right? Um, so things like that. And then you can also define permissions, right? Um, like in this case, we are saying that the hospital can actually create, uh, read, update, and delete the patient records. They can do everything with observation procedures, but insurance plan, they can only read because the insurance plan is actually created by the insurer, right? Um, and uh, there's a hospital, or uh, sorry, the uh, third party administrator, we, who can also read a lot of this information because they, uh, you know, they are in the middle of facilitating the claim settlement process. So you, you do all of that and then you, you know, deploy the uh, application. And what you get after this, right, is a set of REST APIs and uh, GraphQL APIs. So this is where, you know, the, this is the third step, right? Once you, so what this does, right, once you uh, create the application and the settings is it basically deploys uh, a smart contract behind the scenes, right? And once a smart contract is deployed, the next step obviously 
is to be um, as i was saying was is to integrate your existing applications into the blockchain so of course uh, hyperledger fabric itself provides a grpc interface and um, basically uh, you can actually integrate with it and uh, you can there are uh, you can use certificates and all that for signing the transactions and all of that right but that's a bit difficult to use first of all right even if you're using a custom uh, your custom application but then what if we are talking about integrating into an existing um, ERP that a customer has, right? For example, in supply chain industry, uh, many customers would have SAP or Dynamics and things like that, right? So integrating those systems directly in the blockchain, that's where you know uh, more of a REST API interface is more meaningful, and that's what we generate by doing that, right? Um, so of course there are a lot of operations where you can use to create get uh, update delete assets right but what we also provide is a little bit more uh, rich way of doing things like when you get an asset uh, i'll talk about references and resolving that we also provide ways for uh, changing ownership uh, we also provide advanced operations on changing ownership like instead of directly changing ownership somebody can request for change of ownership and then the ownership gets changed uh, and things like that so really uh, diving into uh, uh, a few uh, I'll, I'll show you how few of these things uh, work so basically um, if you look at uh, what i'll do is i'll take the asset uh, the sales case of uh, uh, the the insurance industry that i was talking about um, so let's say, you know, these are the different objects that have been created on the blockchain, right? So I'll not go into the creation part, but I'll talk about more on the, the querying part of it, right? Which is where uh, we have done some work and uh, we believe that, uh, sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so where we believe that, um, you know there's a, there's a lot of opportunity for improvement right and where the real uh, value comes in uh, so basically if you if you uh, look at this right um, this is basically a claim right uh, so a claim has as you can see it's a very it's an extensive json structure so the way that we have modeled our platform is that anybody can basically uh, you know uh, create an asset using the rest apis and only mandatory field is the primary key that 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 has been defined right everything else is sort of optional right as in um, or you know extensible so you can bring in your own uh, json uh, structure all the way um, as, as you want and uh, basically this is completely extensible right so this is whatever exists in the existing system and this is based on fhir standards so you can see that there's a lot of a uh, lot of attributes that uh, that belong to a claim right but fundamentally if you see uh, claim has uh, belongs to a has details about a patient details about an insurance and these themselves are different assets uh, in their own right right so what we have basically done is that when we get a claim right so let's say i'm getting this claim uh, so at that time right what happens is if you see the result right uh, the, the, when I created a claim, right, all that it has is, uh, it says that it belongs to this particular patient, right, and uh, this is the diagnosis and the diagnosis ID or the observation ID. But if I look at the get part of it, when I get the same claim, within diagnosis, this is a diagnosis ID, but we automatically expand the uh, observation, right, with the actual data from the observation. So why do we do that? Um, uh, querying the blockchain is basically not a very easy or um, it's not as performant as a regular database right so if you have to uh, do multiple queries it's it slows down the system a bit so we have developed a system where you can actually get the get an asset with all the referenced information so for example if i look at a more uh, more complex case here there is a procedure right that the uh, the, the patient went through so the procedure has an uh, has a part of which basically points to an observation so the observation itself is expanded and the observation actually has a subject which points to a patient so the patient is fully expanded here and then you know 
uh, those are policies that belong to a patient and the policies are also expanded so you can get everything in one one call basically that's one thing you know which we have found very useful the querying part of it right when you have to query multiple objects and get it out of the system the of course you can get a history about a claim right uh, so we have apis for that uh, which will give you the entire claim and the history of when it was uh, created when it was approved for example in this case right in this case uh, the claim were, there are three records for the claim uh, it was created by uh, this organization so we add a lot of metadata automatically which tells you a lot of information about who the owner is who when it was created updated so on and so forth it was created by this organization which is the uh, hospital and then eventually it was approved uh, the, the it was approved the claim status was approved by a different organization which is a tpa in this case right what we also do uh, provide uh, apart from the regular rest api interface is a graphql face so basically graphql is a way of querying uh, is a you know uh, is a is a very popular way of uh, representing query kind of language over the over a rest or a http interface right um, so basically what we have done is we have done some engineering on top of uh, hyperledger fabric uh, and uh, specifically where couchdb is the backend right so we we basically support a graphql interface where we where uh, you can basically uh, write graphql queries which eventually gets transformed into couchdb rich queries and then the information is sent back uh, the way so so using this right you can actually write uh, query uh, any assets uh, in a much more rich fashion for example right in this particular case if you want to uh, get all the claims that are pending right you can say that okay get the get me all the claims where approval status is pending and get me these uh, attributes of that right so basically when it uh, so there, there are four uh, four claims which are pending and these are the attributes of that right or you do something more uh, complex like you know get me all the claim where uh, there's a particular type of claim uh, and the code is 831 or 832 so the code basically in this particular case tells you what kind of uh, what kind of procedure procedure was done right in this case it says hospital outpatient surgery performed right uh, something like that so i want to get that kind of an information so you can see that you know, i'm getting uh, a complex query which does all of that so that's what uh, we have done with graphql um, which basically you know and it's all all about making that integration easier if you think about it right what it actually does right so so that's the sec, uh, that's the other two parts where you know it's all about uh, right uh, smart contract yourself you get a and uh, you get a framework where you can actually define and do things yourself and then you know uh, you can basically query uh, stuff out and get stuff out in a very rich and uh, rich and easy manner right so this is what how graphql works basically we we uh, convert graphql query into a couchdb rich query and then parse it and parse the response and give it back uh, in a graphql format yeah. so we have a, a graphql engine which does that there's also a concept of event listeners where you know it's all about uh, listening to uh, listening to events that happen in the uh, blockchain and so that you can react uh, to those events in on on your system right so we provide a way to listen to those events have those events delivered to a webhook or a, a web socket and then you can filter the events that you want to be delivered with uh, whether you know it's an, something got added updated or approved you know things like that um, and then your system can basically react uh, to those events uh, based on that. What we also provide is uh, are some ad additional integrations, and we believe you know integration of the blockchain system with with existing ecosystem or applications is really the key for adoption, right? And that's where we actually have gone beyond just exposing APIs, but providing integrations which which are really no code solutions which can directly integrate with the existing customer ecosystems and the way that we have done it is by actually using some of the existing workflow automation platforms if you are aware like zapier is there power automate is there so we have created connectors which can be uh, you know used with along with zapier or uh, 
power automate and uh, basically can do something like you know once uh, when something when a record is uh, added into sap a particular type of entity is added that can trigger a workflow in zapier which will basically call the spira apis and create that asset in the blockchain so you don't have to write any any code for that or similarly you know to the, even to the level of once uh, when you add a record in a csv or an excel sheet then create a record or update a record on the blockchain or vice versa when so when something gets created in the blockchain then it uh, then that event gets sent to zapier or power automate and then based on that you can put it into a database for example and things like that all of that without any any coding required as such and we believe you know this kind of integration is what will make it very easy for blockchain to be adopted in typical enterprise use cases uh, of course you know uh, you can also write your own code as i was showing uh, but some of the in innovations that we have done in that space is even with your own custom chain code you get very similar functionalities you can invoke or query your custom chain code methods using a rest api you can actually query using graphql graphql as well and you can you know add the event listeners or you know you can use the listener functionality with your own uh, chain code as well uh, last but not the least what we have also done is you know if you're if you're anywhere using your own custom chain code or writing your own custom chain code um there is no easy way to debug code from uh, uh, an ide currently like from a visual studio code or any other ID that you are using. So we have actually published a VS Code extension, which makes it easy for uh, for debugging applications right from within Visual Studio Code. Uh, so the way that works is right, you just have to install the uh, extension, you basically, uh, basically uh, provide some configurations to say that this is the debugger that you want to uh, invoke. And basically, just uh, you know, uh, start debugging the code right from within Visual Studio Code, and then you can also submit uh, requests. Uh, so in, you can invoke uh, methods in your chain code right from within uh, Visual Studio Code. You can invo invoke a transaction or query, uh, uh, query, uh, send a query, and then you can get back the results. And the debugger, you can you know, create breakpoints within within the debugger and the debugger will be, uh, the breakpoints will be hit and you can do line by line debugging, inspect the variables and all of that, right? So yeah, so that's what uh, we have, you know, uh, we have done over the period and then what we have basically, uh, you know, realized that how, you know, some of the things that should happen for enterprise blockchain solutions to be adopted at scale across various use cases. And, you know, some of the learnings that we, we uh we had over the period of years right uh based on which we have made this platform so feel free to you know look around visit spider.app and try out the platform um and you know see how it useful it is and if there's any feedback uh we are we are uh, we are more than happy to listen to it and hope that uh, the session was useful um thanks thanks everyone for joining if there are any questions i think i didn't Get a chance to look at the chat but uh if there are any questions i can take that uh, feel free to stay back you know whoever wants to have any questions or uh if you want to ask ask something feel free to unmute and ask yeah um, so, well. uh, uh, thank you for having great presentation i i have a uh, general question maybe for the audience like mostly companies are doing tokenization on any kind of public blockchains so hmm. what motivates an inspiration to do on a private or hyperledger fabricated of blocks. I, I know, but I want to get the answer for the, for the other people. Who, yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. So I think it really all depends on, you know, what you're trying to do, right? Um, if uh, if there are a lot of use cases, you know, where uh, there are the data that you are, the, the assets that you want to talk, tokenize, uh, you don't re necessarily, necessarily don't want to, uh no don't want to put it in a uh, public blockchain right if, if i talk, talk about an asset uh, sorry a supply chain use case for example right um then there's a lot of data about the shipment the product and things like that right which you want to do a track and trace um across different participants so that's probably not uh, a, a use case where you would go to a public chain for example right or you know in the insurance 
uh, or the invoice discounting or supply chain finance kind of use cases, right? Where the collaboration is between between different not really between end users who are directly inter interacting with the blockchain, right? But between organizations who are interacting with each other and there are business process going on between uh, organizations and uh, data exchanges happening, right? So those are really use cases which where private or enterprise blockchain really shines and probably the right uh, right model also, right? Because you don't want that information to be mm -hmm. shared between everyone in the world. You need more access control in it and uh, more more privacy within it yeah so yeah so i agree so uh, for other like uh, even if you read nowadays or maybe go to any any web3 and blockchain uh, events you must be seeing uh, everyone is uh, talking about and building some kind of tokenization on different different framework and recent like sebi circulation about uh, creating some regulatory framework around a uh, fractional ownership of real estates so even if you read today's economic times, they are also mentioning that fractional ownership of holiday homes up after, after SEBI intervention. Mm. So this is this is going to be a hot topic, like how we see in the ICO in 17 and 18 and then NFT in 2021. So yeah. obviously. So I think uh, even there's a question uh, uh, you can ask to Ashwat or uh, his team. You can unmute yourself and you can ask the question. Uh, so just a general question from my side. Um, I know uh, wallets are uh, probably not related to um, uh, physical assets. It's more related to, uh, uh, to movement of uh, money, but any specific use cases uh, uh, that, that Spydra has done around wallet integrations and tokenization in the in that space. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So we have done some work also, but I think you know, in uh, sort of answering the larger question, right? Not necessarily wallet integration is about money or you know cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. It could also be you know, for example, an asset that you own, right? It could be a real estate asset for example right um when you yeah anything that you own uh, can actually go into a wallet but i think in an enterprise case use case scenario right i think the question is more around who are the participants in the network right are mm -hmm. they end users who are in the the participants in the network then yes absolutely it makes sense to basically uh, whatever you are issuing a token or asset or nft goes into the wallet of the user but in a lot right. of cases right the Participants are organizations, like in the insurance use case I was talking about. Uh, and insurance is an asset which is owned by the insurance company, right? Uh, in this case, particular, of course, it's actually issued to a user, but the, in the use case, it's the insurance company that has to do something with it. So in that case, the wallet sort of is owned by the organization and not really by the end user. So I think that's where you need to look at what is the actual use case and where the asset should actually be owned and which wallet it should go into. Right, okay. Thanks for answering. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, so I think a lot of the questions seem to be already answered. So I'm not reading through all of that. But yeah, if you if there's any other questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, if no question, then we can stop and uh, you can find this recording on Hyperledger YouTube channel. All right. Thank you everyone for joining and uh, you have a great day ahead. Thanks very much. Great presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Ashwat. And thank you. Thank you.